Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss that keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. My name is Andrew Stotts from A Stotts Investment Research, the worst podcast host today. And I'm here with featured guest Libby Gill. Libby, are you ready to rock? I'm ready. All right. Well, let me introduce you to the audience. Pretty impressive background here. Libby Gill is an executive coach, leadership expert, and best-selling author. She guides emerging and established leaders to inspire purpose and drive performance. She's a former head of communications for Sony, Universal, and Turner Broadcasting, and her clients include Bank of America, Capital One, Disney, Ernst & Young, Intel, Microsoft, Viacom, and many more. She's been featured on the CBS Early Show, CNN, NPR, and the Today Show, and in the New York Times, Time Magazine, and Wall Street Journal, the author of six books, including the award-winning You Unstuck. Libby's latest book is The Hope-Driven Leader, Harness the Power of Positivity. Libby, take a minute and fill in further tidbits about your life. Well, I can tell you, Andrew, I started my, my professional career as a hand model for Fancy Feast cat food. There you go. You didn't expect that, right? Yeah. And uh, a talking bear at uh, Knott's Berry Farm Amusement Park in Southern California. Buena Park. Um, yeah. <laughs> in Buena Park. That's exactly right. You know that area. But then I got my first job actually working for a television legend who is Norman Lear, who created All in the Family. And from there, I really began my corporate career. Mm. And what, what would you say would be the thing that you learned from Norman Lear? I mean, what a great experience at a young age. Well, it was interesting. I was, I was a youngster and I, I got a job as an assistant in the PR department. Uh, I, Norman was very, I didn't work directly for him, but he owned the company and it was a distribution company, mostly at that point of all those old great sitcoms that are still on TV today. And, and he treated people very well. He was a very decent and very humble man. And what I learned was to be ready for change because even though I started this job and thought, this is, I just landed in the best spot and it's a small company. I'm gonna get to know everybody. I'm gonna learn the whole business. Uh, very shortly after that, it was purchased by Columbia Pictures and then by Coca-Cola and then by Sony. So I learned to just keep raising my hand and, and move with it. And in five years, I became the head of publicity, advertising, and promotion for Sony's worldwide television group. Wow. And, and you know, I'm, I'm very curious. And I, for the audience out there, we're going to change the format a little bit today because Libby has a lot of experience as a leadership expert. And, you know, she's done it through coaching and working with teams. She's done it through writing books about it. And so I thought, what a time, you know, what a critical time for every leader out there to first figure out how to survive and second to figure out how to thrive. And I thought maybe you could start off by just telling us a little bit about, you know, what you do, what you have done as far as working with teams and leaders and maybe about the books a little bit so that we can understand kind of where you're coming from. And then maybe we can go into some stories of things that can help us to get out of this tough situation. Sure. Um, after my first career in communications, and I went from one studio to the next to the next, and most of my teams went with me from place to place, which to me was, I didn't, you know, I was a young leader. I figured, I realized in retrospect that that was just a beautiful honor that people spent a big chunk of their careers with me. And I'm in touch with most of them today. We have what we call our quarterly staff meeting, which is code for happy hour. Now a Zoom virtual happy hour, but nonetheless, we are still very much connected. And, um, and then I decided I'd done, I'd launched so many television shows. I started with Married with Children. And then my last one was the launch of the Dr. Phil show. And I figured there was really nowhere else to go. I mean, literally, I was as high as one could go in that field. So I moved over to the production and development side for a couple of years, which was sort of wacky good fun. But I realized what I really wanted to do was to continue to grow teams, which I did a lot of as a leader. I tended to have the youngest, greenest, biggest staff at any of the studios. And it was my job to you know, justify their existences by turning them into leaders. And I loved that challenge. And I took it very uh, seriously. I thought it was a real, I, I, I felt responsible for the stewardship of young careers. 
And so it was about the time I was thinking, it's time for me to go. I, I read an article in Newsweek about executive coaching. And it was then a brand new field. I didn't want to do the kind of life coaching, you know, figure out where you're going. Although sometimes that is an aspect of it. And I started, I started working with people in career change initially, people that wanted to get into entertainment and then people that wanted to get out of entertainment as, as I had done. And I started writing books and then I started speaking and it just continued to grow. And now it will be, I'm dating myself, but it'll be 20 years this fall. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, let me ask you a question. Is there a difference between leadership and management? Oh, for sure. Definitely. Um, managers, here's a good way to think of it is, is leaders ask questions. They ask questions that propel them into new places and new opportunities. Managers answer questions. They <laughs> get the job done for those who have the vision. And some people are good leader managers. You know, times are tough right now. Companies are strapped. A lot of people have been furloughed or laid off and, and leaders are now also managers. They've got to get their hands dirty. They've got to do the job. And so you can be both, but mm. in an ideal world, leaders are dreaming up the next thing and managers are picking up the pieces and, and building whatever that is. Can, can a business be successful if it only has leaders or it only has managers or do they need both? Oh, you know, it's interesting. There was an experiment done at Google when so many of the um, engineers felt like they could run the shop. They didn't really need managers. <laughs> they were already doing the work. So they tried it as they do. They tried it in a couple of areas and eliminated the managers. And guess what? It did not work quite as well. You know, somebody had to keep the train on the tracks. And that's what managers did. And the best managers are the ones who bridge between the workers or the, the ICs, the, independent, the individual contributors in a business and the leadership level. And they're the ones who are the bridge of information back and forth. Mm. So, you know, I think you need people at all different levels, but one mandate of a leader, and it's not always stated, is it's your job to, to train and develop the next generation of leaders. If you're not doing that and thinking about that, well, you may kind of think you're immortal, but guess what? You're not. And, and all of us should be looking at those succession plans and thinking both formally and informally how we develop other people around us. Um, it's interesting because what I'm thinking about is uh, I got interested in the U.S. Civil War many years ago. And I, it, on the bookshelf behind me, there's about 50 books up top that you can't see that are the books I've read on the Civil War. And I'm just revisiting one of them I've read. And I... I really look at it as a study of strategy and management, leadership and all that. But one of the things I always kind of question myself is why were some generals so good and some generals not so good? And there's many different factors, but one factor that I saw that I felt like was really, really important was that the best generals were touching the front line. They were mm -hmm. trying to get to the front line. In fact, some of the best generals, their soldiers that they, they rallied around their horses and forced them back behind the line because they knew if they lost that general, it would be disaster. But the purpose of riding the line is an, an old words uh, that we don't really use in the same way anymore. Uh, general Grant would say, you know, uh, proceed across the big black river. I expect, you know, uh, that you will have, find no resistance there. Then proceed, you know, what he, he, the way he wrote was just all verbs and verbs mm -hmm. are so powerful. But he said, you know, uh, at, at some point you will, you will contact the enemy. He said, feel the enemy, do not engage. Feel the enemy. And I tried to understand it while they're going along the line. They're trying to feel the place where they're getting some breakthrough. And the purpose of that is then, of course, to allocate the resources of the company or the army towards that breakthrough. If you're just allocating resources across everything, because every you know, engineer says, I need resources, you end up never making that big breakthrough. So that concept of how do you allocate resources, how important is that for leadership, for management? Well, it, it's crucial. And also what you said is, is also why people can win asymmetrical battles. You can win a battle when you are outflanked completely, when you're outnumbered because of the vision 
and the drive and the passion. And because your general is watching the front lines, but it is exactly what you said. You're looking for the gaps. You're looking for the holes. You're looking for your own competitive edge. Where do you slip through the market? Somewhere that other people haven't seen. And yeah, that's critical. And of mm. course, anybody that's, I also work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And when you're starting out and you're bootstrapping, you better figure out the most important thing and focus on that. And often I see people spread themselves really thin, and that's, that's often a, a, a critical downfall to uh, small businesses. Now, there's people that don't understand this concept, so they spread themselves too thin because they never really thought about the importance of you know, rallying their troops around the breakthrough that they're getting. But then there's people that know it, but they end up still spreading themselves too thin. And I'm Are you curious- talking about me, Andrew? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's more. Uh, okay. So I, I have so many ideas in so many different directions that I'm going. And, you know, it's, it's hard. And I'm just curious, like kind of maybe uh, two things. You know, why do people not focus on one area? And how can we help people to focus on that breakthrough area? You are so right. It is the blessing and the curse of the visionary. Too many ideas, too little time. And the first question I often ask, particularly if someone is self-funding, they're an entrepreneur, is do you have a financial base under you? How long can we play this out? Mm -hmm. How long can you try to build this business? And I had one woman who had an interesting alternative health business that she was trying to get off the ground, a kind of a network uh, connecting people uh, that um, she had put seven years into her own money, Uh, but the partners were wrong. Vision was, it wasn't working. And I said to her, you, you put in seven years and you know what the problems are. You know, this area and it's not working. You either throw it out and start over, or I don't know what to tell you. I can't help you. And she said, no, no, I've invested so much. I'm going to just keep working on it. And two, and I said, okay. And two years later, she came back to ask me if I could help her with the messaging around shutting down her business in hopes that she would continue on with some consulting business. And I thought, you know, I couldn't tell her that that's in my study of the science of hopefulness. That is what's called false hope. Mm. She had on the rose colored glasses. She wasn't looking at the metrics. She was going on feeling and gut. And sometimes that's a very valuable thing. But in this case, it, the answer was right there in front of her. Yeah, I'm familiar with this story, and it's a great story that helps illustrate actually a combination of two forces. First is the force of sunk cost fallacy. I've invested all this time and energy. I can't let this go. And then the other force on the other end is saying, yeah, but it's going to work. And that's the false hope. And it's interesting, you know, you can get trapped in this. So what if, if she had listened or if other people are trapped, let's say, They've sunk a lot of time and energy into something. They've done it well, but it's not going where they want. They may have had false hope, but today they're listening to you. You know, what piece of advice from your experience would you tell them to help them in this, this moment where it's scary as hell? Yeah, it's, it is scary as hell. And a lot of us and smart people out there and good companies are just getting battered and we don't know when it's going to end or how it's going to end. And that's the mm-hmm. uncertainty and the ambiguity is what's really killing people, you know, in addition to the, the healthcare crisis that we're in and who knows when that will end. But I think we go back to what I call, and I've done this with clients for years, is again, based on the science of hopefulness, which is called hope theory is all about having a vision of the future that may be wildly ambitious, but is attainable. Her vision was not attainable. What she wanted to do geographically did not work. You know, her plan and vision was not going to work. So we go first to the vision. And typically when I work with groups and I do a lot of virtual presenting now, I'll ask about a one-year vision. Now a company, you might have a five-year, a 20-year, Human beings can wrap their heads around about a year or 18 months. Mm -hmm. So I would typically ask people, where do you want to be in a year? Right now, I ask people where they want to be in 90 days. Because a year seems so foreign and so there's so many things we can't predict. So first is is the clarity around that vision. And, And being able, most people think they've got it. But if you ask them and start to poke some holes, 
they don't really see it. They don't quite know how to measure it. They can't really articulate it to others. So that's the first step. And secondly is how do you simplify the path to getting there? What must you get out of the way, whether those are, are you know, false, false hope or wrong ideas, uh, bad habits, the wrong people? And then what do you need to bring in? It may be boosting your health and energy. It may be uh, investors. It, may, it can be all kinds of things. It can be a coach who can guide you. So simplify the pathway to getting not just from A to B, but from A to Z as rapidly as you can. Then it's executing the plan. And we can all have our visionary ideas all day long. And you know it comes down to who's going to get it done. It was really interesting when I was in Hollywood in, in development and I worked on the reality side of television. People would come pitch ideas and it was, it was very common that the same idea would be sort of floating in the air at the same time, just like it happens with two or three movies on the same theme come out. Yep. And the, the cell would go not to the most brilliant idea, but the one who had a track record attached to that was always about execution. So that's the third step. And then the fourth is once you've implemented any step of that path, whether it's a phone call or a presentation or a meeting or a huge project, you sit back and review it. You reflect on what you've learned and then you refine it for the future. And to me, that's what's gotten me from changing careers out of a very difficult family as a kid. Um, we both went to the same college, which mm. is just ironic. There aren't too Amazing. many people halfway around the world that know our, our Cal State Long Beach College. Go and, Beach. Uh, go, yeah, 49ers. <laughs> yeah, and I, um, by the, I was one of six kids. And by the time, you know, my siblings went to Princeton and Cornell. By the time they got to me, fourth out of the six, it was kind of good all the money we got left. Yeah, it was gone. I was on my own. And, uh, and I figured it out. And it was, it's, it's really not that much different in life than it is in business. Mm. You have a clear vision, you persevere, you course correct, and you continue to move towards that as long as that vision stays true to what's in your, your heart and your mind and your gut. So I'd like to just break that down in one way that I, that I think is an interesting way of looking at it is that I, the implementation part, let's leave that because, you know, that's a pretty clear, you know, we know what we've got to do. We've got to map that out. But I want to go back to the vision because there are some people who do create a vision very well. And, but, you know, there's more steps to that. If, if just creating a good vision, like for instance, some of the coaches, some of the, the marketing, you know, multi-level marketing things teach people like, create a vision board or that type of thing. But just, I remember someone came to me with this vision board and it was pretty cool, you know? And I thought, what's the chance of that vision happening? Now, of course, implementation is one of the main reasons why it doesn't happen. So let's leave that. Let's ask the question, you know, what is it about the vision and the hope component of the vision that makes it a good vision? Okay, first of all, you need to have a fundamental belief that change is possible. And when you think about that, well, most of us think, okay, of course change is possible. But no, not everybody believes that. There are plenty of people out there who say things like, it is what it is. You can't fight City Hall. Don't beat your head against, you know, all of those things, justifying their defense of the status quo. They're going to stay exactly where they are forever. And, you know, there's a place a, a much smaller place than there used to be for them in the, in the business world. We still need, you know, the widget pushers of the world. But as we become more and more an idea imagination age, we're even beyond information. It's about mm. ideas and imagination. We need to be able to um, carry out those vision. And, and, and it, it, again, it goes back to that sort of fundamental belief, change is possible, and I can make this happen given these conditions. So one of the words that I hear you say is the word belief. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are many people that paint a vision for their company for themselves, but in their heart, they don't really believe yeah. that they can attain it. And if they, in their heart, they don't really believe they can attain it. How could they ever lead a team to that location? I think they get found out pretty quickly. Um, although some can fake it better than others, but you, people give themselves away if you pay attention in the things they say and the actions they take. Right now, lots of people talking about compassion, 
always been important to me. That was a big deal for me in my corporate life. When people asked what was my, you know, best moment of leadership, it was when we rallied around someone with a, with a very serious form of cancer mm. and, uh, and made sure her job was covered and nobody knew about it. And that to me was as good as it got. Mm. Um, but back to, what was your question again, Andrew? I've totally well, gone off I'm, track. I'm, I'm just thinking about the concept of belief. A belief. You know, like, because I, yeah. I, I teach something that's a little bit weird. And, um, you, and maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it to the test with you. Uh, weird for me? That's, yeah. that's a, you, you got go. a long ways to go, but okay. So I, I created many years ago a, a planner, a life planner book for myself. And it's called Plan Your Work, Work Your Plan. I just printed it up for myself for many years. And then some of the people around me, I printed it up for them. And so we use it. But I, I did some seminars about it for people that ask, you know, how do you achieve the things that you've achieved? And I said, you know, the first thing is that you've got to identify what it is that you want, obviously the vision. But the thing is, is that many people don't actually believe they can achieve it. So I said, I asked the question to myself, can you build belief? And what I said to them is that the way that I build belief is through words. So someone else may build belief through a vision board. But for me, I, set, I have a little template. And that template basically has three words and then a description of those words and then three actions under it that if I was that, I would be doing these things. So to give an example, one of them was, you know, uh, I am, you know, uh, healthy, wealthy, and attractive those three words. Okay. That's, that fits into my format, three words. And then let's talk about attractive because I mean, obviously, but anybody viewing this, you may have your doubts, but what do I mean by attractive? What I needed to do is describe what, detra what attractive means. And to me, it means I attract good things and good people. Mm -hmm. So then I asked the question, okay, what would be the actions of somebody that attracts good things and good people? And I listed out, I share my positive energy with one new person every day. And I help one person take a step towards their goal every day. And the last one, which I loved so much, and it helped me is all my words are positive. And I remember many years ago, I used to be, you know, oh, I'm so busy, I'm stressed, it's all this, I used to communicate that message. And then I realized that, you know, I don't want to communicate that message. So I decided that all my words are positive. And so mm -hmm. by doing that, I built the belief that I was attractive. And that helped me get to the point where I became more attractive in this world. And so there's this concept of belief that you mentioned. I'm just curious, what are your, what's your experience with the word belief or with believing versus just having the vision? I, I think belief, well, to me, it's when you link belief to behavior, that's where the magic comes in. You link belief to behavior, to the vision, then you're just going to, you're just going to act your way till you get there. Um, and there are things like, you know, I have my own, my 10 things I've listed in my book, You Unstuck, mm -hmm. and occasionally somebody will poke me on one of them, but I believe in candor. I believe in being honest with people, not necessarily always nice. My job is to tell people the truth. I don't coach friends and close friends and family members unless there's a reason, but I tell people the truth. So I always believe it's candor and kindness. And th those are good three words right there. Um, so it's, it's really, it, it's back to walking your talk. It's knowing what your values are and people who are unclear or muddy on that, or who say, you know, we know this as employees in the corporate world, you know, when somebody is just feeding you a line, like they read a management book over the weekend and now they ask about your family and you think, well, where'd that come from? <laughs> but in this time when people are suffering, really suffering and looking for support and kindness and real compassion, it's not enough to think you do it. If you are compassionate, you show that to, to people. And, and I think that can sometimes be missing. So that's not really a belief if you're not acting upon it. Mm. So it's the connection between the action and the belief and the, uh, the vision. Um, and let me ask you, like, what can you tell me about one of your best success stories where you walked into a management team or you walked into a, a CEO or whatever and it was a mess and you were able to help them turn around and maybe that could help us to understand kind of more about how you do or what you do. Well, I have the good fortune of I'm often called in when things are going well, but they want them to be better. 
um, coaching used to be a bit of a punishment. It was like being called into the principal's office. And now companies invest in coaches for their high performers or often people in new positions. So for example, I worked with a, a relatively new Hollywood studio. There are young studios still popping up. And someone had been promoted to the position of president. She had been a, we would call the equivalent of a line worker. She was a producer. So she had got her hands dirty. She was in there. She was, had teams, but not an entire corporation. Now suddenly she's a president with hundreds of people underneath her. And understanding what that meant to be a leader at that level was, was eye-opening. I mean, she, there were moments, you're talking about belief, that was kind of like, what? They gave me this job? And it took a while to sort of grow into that emotionally. And then another big piece of it was making the tough calls and having the difficult conversations, which for people who are not particularly confrontational, don't enjoy that, you've got to learn that's part of the territory. You're the one that's going to do the hiring and the firing, and you're the one that's going to do the course correcting and the managing of people and training others to do the same. And so being able to help someone get to that position where she really believed she had authority, and she did, uh, and became very comfortable in that role and became consequently much more visible in the industry at large was a real success story. And why, let me ask you, why do you think it's so hard for companies, CEOs, management teams, or individuals to make lasting change in their companies or in their life? There are so many reasons, and there are so many studies on this, but basically, you know, it's difficult to, the more layered it is, the more difficult it is to turn a ship around, the more levels and the more bureaucratic, we are, we can be too wedded to the process. And we've got to start with the, you know, we're, we're animals as much as we sort of forget that we are, we are an animal species and we rely on instinct and emotion. It is feelings that come first and logic and rationale comes second. Well, you know this in the yep. investment world more than anything, confidence, all of those things that are emotions. They're not, you know, this is not a strategy. You can say tomorrow we'll be confident or look at our, you just don't know. So we have to really be able to change people's hearts around this change. You've, and there are some steps. You've got to show them what the benefit is, what their role is, what they have to do, why they have to do it, and how they can influence others. Because I find this is a subject I deal with all the time. And when I go into an organization, I see about 20, maybe 25% of people say, finally, we're going to make all these changes. It's going to be so much better. And then the continuum, the other 75% from I'd rather die than change all the way down to, okay, if I have to, I will. Mm. And everything in between. And it's just because we, we live by fight or flight. We are tribal. We are primitive. And if we're going down a new path, something might jump out and eat us. And that's how we're wired. Let me ask you a question that I ask. I have a, a, a work with a management team I'm doing in a couple of weeks. And I always ask this question before uh, of all of them through a kind of a survey. And the question is, what level of cooperation between departments and employees is necessary to become successful? Oh. Now, I, I'm going to give you the, I'll, I'll give you my, my answers and then you pick yeah. one. Very low, moderately low, moderately high, or very high. I'd say it's somewhere between, I'd say moderate to moderately high. Okay. And um, now let me ask you another question is the, the, what do you think is the level of cooperation between departments and employees in the average company? I'd say is moderately it, low. Right. And that's or low. The, yeah. yeah. And that's the breakdown. I think that's part of what I had mentioned when we were talking before is that my studies with Dr. Deming and then writing my, my book about his 14 points really highlighted that, you know, part of what's happening is that businesses are incentivizing individuals or departments. And what's happening is they're optimizing their performance. At, and then they could be in fact, damaging the performance of the overall company. Dr. Deming used the example of an orchestra. If everybody did their best, they would all stand up at the same time. But in fact, we have to sub optimize parts of a company and parts of an orchestra in order to optimize the total output. How does that, you know, what is your thought on the level of cooperation and, and how companies can improve in that area? 
it, it, again, I think, it, I, you know, it's funny because I just coached a, a leader at a big company that makes items that are on your desk right now. Mm. And um, very process oriented. And I often do 360 assessments and talk to other team members. And some people think, oh, you're just trying to play gotcha. And I think that's ridiculous because we have one story we tell ourselves and a collective group of our colleagues may have a different story. And he was pretty process oriented, very kind of cut and dry, did a great job, but not a lot of warmth or heart. And people felt that. And this is a time when we need to stress that side of this. Mm. You call the touchy feely stuff. I said, yeah, the touchy feely stuff is important now. <laughs> so I said, here, I got a couple of exercises for you from different people I've worked with. You try them. And one was a client that I had that felt they needed to up the level of collaboration. So he had everybody at the Monday morning meeting and everybody's got one of those, whatever day it is, it's the mm. Monday morning meeting. And he started with a personal anecdote and he wanted everybody to share a little weekend or, you know, whatever, what you watched on TV or what your did, kid did in their sports league. And at first they all gave him the, yeah, right. What's going on here? And he kept it up. And pretty soon he saw the, the information flowing, the level of, of trust, the collaboration and the bureaucracy didn't really count anymore. People just started to share. And so I told this guy to try it and he thought, yeah, I could do that. And I said, now I've got one for these times. You do, you do your call on Zoom or your platform. And he said, yeah, do our regular call, international group. I said, okay, ask him to show their footwear. <laughs> and he just cracked up and then of course held his, you know, his sneakers up to the screen for me to see. I said, well, there you go. It's funny, it's personal. Some people, they're gonna have bare feet. Other people are going to be in their slippers. Oh, there you go. With, let's see the footwear. You got on a nice kind of, is that a, a top siders kind of thing? It's a your Crocs. It's a version of, I mean, it's Crocs. It's Crocs. Yeah. I just have the old ones that the chefs there wear. That's go. what I use in the garden. But, and now I have uh, nothing on my feet. It's 90 <laughs> degrees here today. Yeah. But my, my goal was get a little personal, get a little human. I mean, this is a time where we've seen people with their toddlers crawling across their laps, mm. with their dogs barking in the same room. It's like, that's, a, you know, cats out of the bag. We're yep. all just regular people. And, <laughs> uh, and he thought that was okay. Once he built it into kind of his process of how meetings run, it was all right. That's, that's excellent advice. I think one of the things about working for most of my career, basically, in Thailand is that this is where Thai people shine. They build personal relationships at work. They spend time together outside of work. You know, like it's really a mix because also I think one of the things I learned about Thai culture is that uh, they're not necessarily money driven. They're relationship driven and happiness driven. So, in, and that, that's an important lesson because uh, sometimes new managers come to Thailand and they say, well, we're going to have a sales contest and we're going to have a, a cash bonus of that. And they find out that it actually isn't the main motivating force. And that can be very frustrating for a manager that's used to hanging out a hundred dollar bill and saying, whoever gets this, you know, gets this first. And that's a unique, you know, thing about it. Um, so let's, let's try to wrap this up by what I want to do is take, you know, all of your experience and the things that you've, seen and things that you've taught, the things that you've written about. And let's bring it down to, you know, one or two things that could help the listener right now who is in fact struggling. They're, they're leading their business. Let, let's talk about them as a, a leader of their business. They're leading their small company, their big company. They've been struggling. You know, they're making some wins, but they're, they're struggling big time. What one or two pieces of advice would you give them that they could literally end this call and sit down and, and think about, write down, do. Yeah, I can tell you what that is. It is, it's lonely at the top, like a lot of people say. I think for leaders to reach out for support, and they all know that, but it doesn't mean that they do that. And when COVID started and the lockdown happened, I thought, like you, it's like, what's going to happen to my business? I have no idea. And I thought, well, I'm not the only one struggling. I'm going to just start a coaching group. And I had people for free. So once a week. And I had people from Australia and Trinidad and Canada and all over the States. And we are still together four months later. 
because of the support and the community and the fact that people are very open about my business will never work again. And there's, you know, 20 people to tell you how it will. And by gosh, it, then it did. And it's, it's an amazing thing when you, you, you got to open up and it, it's hard if you're a very private person to do that and show that level of vulnerability and some people perceive as weakness, but it's a tough time. And yeah. we, got to open up ourselves to help and support from others. That's a, I think that that is the best advice because really, you know, it is lonely. It is scary. It is unknown. And it's that for everybody, but for the leader in particular, you have the fates of many people, you know, resting on the decisions that you make. And the truth is, is that, you know, we're in uncharted territory. So getting some support. So I think for the people that are listening, what I would challenge you to do is to think about that one person that you would trust that you know is not going to talk about what you guys have talked about and you know who that person is call them today and just start a conversation how are you doing and then start the conversation because it is very it can be lonely and we need support so that's my challenge that comes out of this discussion so my last question for you is, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Ah, next 12 months. Well, it's interesting that I have been moving much of my business online uh, before any of this lockdown started, other than I do a lot of live speaking. That, when that comes back, I love to do that. That's mm. just great fun, the interaction with the audience. And other than that, I'm gonna move to coaching uh, groups. I just started a writing group for people that need accountability and support while they write. We literally get together on a video platform and assignments and people stay focused. It's again, that kind of accountability mm. is to just build those online programs and to move to the virtual world, which allows me to touch people in all kinds of countries and places. Very exciting. All right, listeners, there you have it. A great discussion of loss, struggle, and triumph. To find more stories like this, go to myworstinvestmentever.com. And Libby, I wanna thank you for coming on the show. I know it's a little bit of a different format, but I think you've made it really fantastic for all of us to think about, you know, hope, leadership, vision, action, and the idea that you ended this show with, which is the idea about it can be very lonely. It can be lonely at the top. And I think we've come up with a great challenge for everybody listening is reach out to that one person you trust and just talk to them. So I want to congratulate you for taking the time to talk about struggles as opposed to triumphs. And for that, I want to, you know, appreciate the time that you've given us. Do you have any parting words for the audience? I do. In the, in the immortal words of Robert Louis Stevenson, it is better to travel hopefully than it is to arrive. Well, that is a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is Andrew Stotts, the worst podcast host today, saying I'll see you on the upside.